So today we're going to talk about sensory function. Um, and my name is Chantal Manhart, and so we will get through this as quick as we can for you guys. So this is chapter 14, which is pain, temperature, sleep, and sensory function. Pain is um, defined as the International Association for the Study of Pain and the American Pain Society define pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. So it cannot be defined, identified, or measured by an observer. And pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is, existing whenever he says it does. So pain is associated with many conditions, and therefore it warrants further discussion. Pain is a protective mechanism warning the body when something is wrong. In addition, pain is the most common reason people seek medical t attention and can be used to a diagnosis. Pain is a, is a subjective feeling, and the perception of pain and the level at which it is sensed can be influenced by affective behavior, cognitive, sensory, and physiologic factors. Unrelieved pain can be delayed healing, stimulate the stress response, and result in pain tolerance. So there are different categories, actually three categories of pain. There's neurophysiologic pain, neurogenic pain, and temporal pain, which is time-related duration. Um, neurophysiologic pain is either nociceptive pain or neuropathic pain. Nociceptive pain is acute pain, is normal, proactive, protective mechanism. It can be seconds to days, up to three months. It can arise from cutaneous deep somatic or visceral structures. It's classified as somatic pain. It arises from the skin, joints, or muscles. It can be sharp, dull, or aching, um, throbbing, and poorly localized. Visceral pain is pain in the internal organs and the lining of the body cavities and poorly localized with an aching, gnawing, throbbing, or intermittent cramping. Referred pain is the visceral pain that often radiates and spreads away from the actual site of the pain. Neuropathic pain um, that is non-nociceptive can be central pain, can be a central pain lesion in the brain or spinal cord or a peripheral pain lesion in the peripheral nervous system. Um, chronic or persistent pain has been defined as lasting for more than three to six months and is pain that lasts well beyond the expected normal healing time. Neuropathic pain is chronic pain initiated by or caused by a primary lesion or dysfunction in the nervous system and led to long-term changes in pain pathway structures, or abnormal process of sensory information. This pain is described as burning, shooting, shock-like, or tingling. Um, pain is influenced by many factors, including genetics, cultural, peripheral um, preferences, gender roles, life experiences, including pain experiences, and their level of health. The pain threshold is defined as the lowest intensity of pain that person can recognize, and the pain tolerance is defined as the greatest intensity of pain that a person can endure. Pain tolerance generally decreases with repeat exposure to pain and may increase with alcohol consumption, persistent use of opioid meds, um, 
and distracting activities um, and strong beliefs and faith. This pathway is um, here to show you the nociception pathway. Um, and it shows all the different um, pain perceptions and the pain inhibitors, the pain facilitators, and their pathways. So as nurses, we're going to be responsible for doing um, a pain assessment. And that means we're going to ask for onset, description, localization, radiation, where does it radiate to, intensity, the quality, the pattern, does anything relieve it, exacerbate the pain. The most reliable indicator of pain is the patient's self-report. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with using pain scales, some are 1 to 5, some are 1 to 10. Um, I always try to say to the patient, um, look at the pain scale and look at the faces on the pain scale um, because I love it when the patient's smiling and they look at us and they say, yes, my pain's a 10. And they are laughing and talking and I'm always like, well, the pain scale, 10 is the worst pain you've ever had in your life. So it's interesting, but we can't judge somebody's pain. Um, Interventions obviously can be pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic. So if it is a non-pharmacologic, it could be anything from comfort measures, um, ice, topic, um, ice. It could be sometimes they will even um, like massage, uh, relaxation techniques, vision um, techniques. Also, remember, if we are giving meds, um, we have to re an NSAID, a narcotic, we need to go back and assess if it worked. Um, they're very, very strict down with opioid use, so you will see most doctors, unless it's a surgery, will try to get away from using it um, because they really have cracked down on um, how often we write for those um, and is it appropriate. So nerve fibers that carry pain impulses. So we have our um, alpha delta fibers, our A delta fibers. Um, they're the large myelinated fibers that um, are going to rapidly transmit sharp um, pain. Um, they're your fast pain sensa um, sensations. So if you think about it, they're like a burn, a pinprick that get you to do that quick spinal withdrawal so that you don't continue to have your hand there in the fire or continuing to get pricked. The C fibers um, are the most numerous. Their impulses are slower. They're the slow pain. They're the small unmyelinated. Um, they're located in muscles, tendon, body organs, and in the skin. Um, they're your dull, aching, burning sensations that can be constant. Um, then you've got your um, alpha beta fibers. They're large myelinating fibers that transmit touch and vibratory sensations. They stimulate an inhibitor, inhibitory neuron and decrease pain transmission. Um, so they're the ones that are, um, if you rub that area that's been burned, um, to try to get relief. Like I said earlier, acute pain has a protect, is a protective mechanism that alerts the individual to a condition or an experience that is immediately harmful. It stimulates the autonomic nervous system to increase heart rate, hypertension, diaphoresis, and dilated pupils. We have different types of pain. There's cutaneous or somatic pain that arises from the superficial structures such as skin and foot subcutaneous tissues. An example of this would be a paper cut. Um, we have our deep somatic pain. It originates deep in the body structures, the perineosteum, um, muscles, tendons, joints, um, blood vessels. Um, that one's going to be more um, 
stimuli such as strong pressures on the bones, ischemic um, to muscle tissue damage. Um, your visceral originates in the visceral organs and one of the most common types of pain produced by disease. Um, and that's going to be um, stretching, distension, ischemia of tissues in the body, and that could be like your appendix pain. Um, your referred pain is pain perceived at the site, and it goes to, and is at different um, point of origin than at the um, inverted from the same spinal segment. So a lot of times people will have um, referred pain, which could be um, um, pain that is, um, they get foot pain, but the pain actually is from um, a split disc in their back or a herniated disc in their back. Your chronic pain uh, is pain that lasts more than three to six months. It's chronic or persistent pain. It can be intermittent. It appears to be out of proportion to any observable tissue injury. It produces significant behavior or psychological changes. Usually we do not see um, physiological signs um, as in acute states. Um, you may see patients who have depression, difficulty eating, sleeping, preoccupation with the pain, and the need to hide um, how the need to hide how conflicting the drive of the pain is um, because they don't want these people worry about being labeled um, complainers. So fever, um, this is really uh, um, is really um, triggered by a temporary resetting of the hypothalamic thermostat. Um, and if you think about it, if the temperature is low or high, the hypothalamus will trigger the heat production and heat conservation or heat loss mechanism. Um, the heat producing mechanism begins with the hypothalamic um, thyrotropin stimulating hormone release, releasing um, the TSH RH, um, and it stimulates the anterior pituitary to release a thyroid stimulating hormone, which acts on the thyroid gland and stimulates causing the release of epinephrine into the bloodstream. Then epinephrine causes vasoconstriction, stimulating glycolysis and increasing metabolic rate, thus increasing body heat. Um, and then what happens is that we will have um, endogenous pyrogens or endotoxins produced by the pathogens stimulate the release of the endogenous pyrogens from the um, phago phagocytic cells, inducing um, tumor necrosis factor alpha and interferon. They're raising the thermal set point um, by inducing the hypothalamic um, system of prostaglandin E2, which is part of the heat production and conservation. Um, so that's how we get the endogenous and the endogenous pyrogens to help us out. Um, the fever of unknown origin is a body temperature of greater than 101 to 101 or a 38.3 degrees Celsius for longer than three weeks of undiagnosed um, or after three days of a hospitalization investigation or three outpatient visits um, 
with a week of ambulatory investigation um, is the definition of a fever of unknown origin. And we don't have an answer after all of that. Um, so that's where we get those definitions from. I like this um, pictorial because it actually shows the release of the prostaglandin 2, and it shows how um, we get the generation of increased muscle contractions, shivering reflux to get a fever, and it also shows our heat conservation method to get us our fever. So I do like it. I think a picture says a lot. So there are benefits of fevers because obviously, why do we get a fever? We get fever because it's gonna, our body's responding to something and its job is to kill microorganisms. And it's gonna decrease serum levels of iron, zinc, and copper. Um, and part of that is because if it breaks down the replication of the iron, zinc, and copper, um, that's going to break down that replication of cells, okay? Um, and it's going to promote lysosomal breakdown and audio destruction of cells, um, which then again is that replication of cells gets broke, all right? That's what we want. We don't want microorganisms replicating. Um, we're going to have increased lymphocytic transformation and um, phagocytosis motility. And what we want there is our immune, res our immune response is improving, okay? And it augments antiviral interferon production and phagocytosis, which again is our immune system's response. Um, what we need to worry about is in our elderly population, they do not get the response to a fever um, in time, so they get this delayed response, and so they don't get this protective, the protective effects. And with our young kids, what happens is um, they respond quickly, and so their fevers get extremely high very quickly. And they usually will get what we call febrile seizures. And this is common in under the age of five. So when we're starting to try to give medications for fevers, we want to think about when we're giving them and why we're giving them. Do we want them to have a fever? Do we not? And when are we giving them so that they don't get too high? Hyperthermia is elevation of the body temperature without an increase in the hypothalamic set point. It can produce nerve damage, coagulation of um, cell proteins, and death. It may be therapeutic, accidental, or associated with stroke or head trauma. Um, it is not mediated by pyrogens. Um, it is defined at 41 degrees Celsius or 105.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And their nerve damage will produce, nerve damage happens and produces convulsions. At 43 degrees Celsius or 109.5 degrees Fahrenheit, death results. Therapeutic hyperthermia is a form of local, regional, or whole body hyperthermia used to destroy pathological microorganisms or tumor cells by facilitating the host natural immune process or tumor blood flow. Um, then we have accidental hyperthermia, and that's broken into several different um, categories. One is heat cramps. It's severe spasmodic cramps in the abdomen and extremities that follow prolonged sweating and associated with sodium loss. Um, there's heat exhaustion, which results from prolonged high core or environmental temperatures, which cause profound vasodilation and mental temperatures. This causes a vasodilation response that leads to dehydration, decreased plasma volumes, hypotension, um, decreased cardiac output, and tachycardia. Patients usually will have weakness, dizziness, confusion, nausea, and fainting. Heat stroke is potentially a lethal result of an overstressed thermoregulatory thermoregulatory center brought on by exertion 
um, by overexposure of environmental heat or from impaired physiological mechanisms for heat loss. Um, temperatures of 104 Fahrenheit, high core temperatures, absence of sweating, rapid pulse rate, confusion, agitation, and coma. If not treated, it can progress to death. Malignant hyperthermia is a potentially lethal hypermetabolic complication of a rare inherited muscle disorder that may be triggered by inhaled anesthetics or depolarizing muscle um, relaxants. This um, working in surgery was something that we were all trained to watch for because you don't want somebody having this. And this is why they always ask if anybody ever has trouble with anesthesia in your family or trouble with um, regulating their temperatures because we don't want to see this in a surgery case. Um, hypothermia produces um, a depression of the central nervous system and respiratory system. It can cause vasoconstriction, alterations in microcirculation and coagulation and ischemic tissue damage. Um, ice crystals can actually form in the cells causing them to rupture and to die. Um, this usually is going to happen at a core temp of 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. There's two types of hypothermia. Um, there's therapeutic hypothermia, which is used to slow metabol metabolism and preserve ischemic tissue during surgery or limb reimplantation. This may lead to ventricular fibrillation and cardiac arrest. Um, there is accidental hypothermia, which is commonly the result of a sudden emergence into cold water um, for or prolonged cold exposure. Um, there's tissue hypothermia, which um, slows the rate of cellular metabolism, increases blood viscosity, and slows blood flow, flow through the microcirculation, and it facilitates blood coagulation, stimulates vasoconstriction. Um, now we're going to talk about visual dysfunctions. So strabismus refers to abnormal eye movement or alignment, and it results in loss of binocular vision. Um, so loss of vision or amblyopia um, re is, reduce is reduced vision in the affected eye caused by cerebral blockage of the visual, visual stimuli. Um, and there's also diplopia, which is um, double vision, and it's mainly the primary symptom that you will see with this. Um, and the deviation is described according to the direction of the eye movement. So if it is um, um, esotropia, it is an inward movement. If it's extropia, it's outward. If it's hypertropia, it's up. And if it's hypotropia, it's down. Treatment is surgical, or if it's non-surgical, it's patching glasses and eye exercises. Um, but you want to catch this and get it treated right away. Nystagmus is an involuntary unilateral or bilateral rhythmic movement of the eyes. And there's two different types. There's pendu, pendu, ugh, sorry guys, pendular nystagmus, which um, is by a regular back and forth movement of the eyes. It's just a real steady back and forth. In jerkular or in jerk nystagmus, um, it's a phase of the eye movement is faster than the other. So it's like you'll see it go slow and then it jerks back fast. It may go slow to the out and then jerks back fast. As we just talked about alterations in visual acuity, um, we're talking still about amblyopia. That's the lazy eye. Vision loss can be 20-25 to legal blindness of 2200. It's the leading cause of visual impairment. Um, 
Obviously, it can cause visual deprivation, abnormal binocular vision, and it needs surgery. It needs to be caught early. Um, there's cataracts. It's a cloudy or opaque um, area in the ocular lens. Um, it's the leading cause of blindness in the world. Elderly are at your greatest risk. Um, you're going to um, have decreased visual acuity, blurred vision, a glare, and a decrease in color perception. It can be unilateral or bilateral. They're going to have decreased red reflux. Um, surgery is usually done um, with this, and they usually replace it with an artificial lens. And what they do is they do one eye at a time, and it's usually done. They'll do one eye, and then the in like two weeks, they do the other eye. Here's just a picture of a cataract so you can see it. Age-related macular degeneration refers to a deterioration in the macular area of the macular area of the retina. So it's deterioration in the macular area of the macular area of the retina. Um, major causes of blindness in the elderly. Your risk factors are being female, Caucasian, and smoking. Um, and there's several different types. There's atropic, which is considered dry or non-exudative. Um, it's more common. It's slowly progressive. It's due to um, degeneration of retinal cells. And then there's the neovascular or the wet or exudative, and that's abnormal um, chlorodell blood vessel growth. So they get these extra blood vessels, and then the blood vessels leak, and eventually they can get retinal detachment with this. But when those blood vessels leak, their vision gets real black and dark. Um, uh, it is irreversible. It's late stages with um, they complain of trouble seeing um, faces clear. Um, they have trouble seeing long distance. Some may even have trouble with close-up work, and they have trouble distinguishing colors. Um, they do have us um, have patients take vitamins in, that contain antioxidants and zinc for age-related eye disease. Um, smokers should not use these um, vitamins. Um, for the wet macular degeneration, they do have some laser eye surgery that they sometimes will attempt. Um, and they do also do this photodynamic therapy where they inject drugs to destroy those leaky blood vessels into the eye. They actually go into the eye and inject them. Um, they also do angiogenesis um, or antivascular endothelial growth factor therapy, which are meds that are injected into the eye to slow the formation of those new blood vessels in the eye. Um, also, we try some visual um, aid by using magnifying glasses and large prints. We're just going to talk about aqueous humor just because the next disease we're talking about is um, really has a lot to do with this. Aqueous humor is formed by the ciliary body and fills the aqueous chamber. It helps maintain the pressure inside the eye and enters the eye by flowing between the iris and the lens to the aqueous chamber. Um, it provides nutrients and oxygen to the lens and the cornea, and it drains into the tubules of the um, trabucular meshwork, and it carries away cellular waste and is reabsorbed into the canal of shim. We're talking about that because open angle glaucoma is the iro um, is in the irocorneal angle remains open. The outflow obstruction of the um, aqueous humor is at the um, trigular meshwork or the canal shum. It's asymptomatic to gradual visual changes, um, and those visual changes are either tunnel vision, blurred vision, halos around the light or decreased color discrimination. And they just come on gradual, so they don't even realize they're going on. They actually get a gradual buildup of the aqueous humor, um, and they have damage to the optical nerve and the visual field loss. 
Um, risk factors include hereditary um, African American um, having hypertension or diabetes. Um, it's diagnosed usually with um, Alzheimer. Let's try that and again. Um, Ophthalmoscopy visualization, measurement of the INO um, pressures. Also, they are treated with pharmacologic beta blocker, um, androgenergic in agonist, um, cholinergic agonist, topically, and pharmacologically, if not effective, they sometimes have to go in and do laser or surgery um, to leave pressure. Um, in closed angle glaucoma, which is a medical emergency, this results from a sudden blockage of the aqueous humor outflow. Um, this blockage can be caused by trauma, sudden pupil dilation, exposure of bright lights after prolonged exposure to darkness. Um, prolonged pupil dilation, for example, medications for exams, or emotional stress. Closed angle glaucoma is typically unilateral but may affect both eyes. Its clinically manifestations are usually sudden onset and worsen quickly. These manifest manifestations may include severe eye pain, headache, nausea, vomiting, um, a non-reactive pupil, erythema, haziness, of the cornea, visual changes, halos around light, and cloudy vision. Um, they're going to have ophthalmic surgery immediately um, to redu reduce those ino pressures. Um, here, this is the normal appearance of the retina, and what happens is the optic nerve enters at the optic disc. Um, retinal arteries and veins can be seen at the center of the optic disc. Um, retinal blood vessels are smooth with relatively straight paths. So you can see how smooth they are, especially in the picture on the right. So we're going to talk about papilledema and retinal detachment. Um, papilledema um, is edema and inflammation of the optic nerve. Um, optic disc protrudes into the eye with blurred margins. Blood vessels in its center are not distinct, and the pressure in the eye has caused them to collapse. Um, you're going to get retinal detachment. Um, it's going to tear or break. It's an acute condition that occurs when the retina separates from its supporting structures. The separation can happen spontaneously or because of severe nearsightedness, trauma, diabetes, mellitus, inflammation, degenerative aging changes, and scar tissue. Retinal um, detachment occurs when the um, viscous femora leaks through a retinal tear and accumulates underneath the retina. Leakage can also occur through teeny holes where the retina has um, thinned due to the aging or other retinal disorders. Um, less commonly, glue can also leak directly underneath the retina without a tear or a break. As this as viscerous humerus collects underneath, um, it is the retina peels away from the underlying, underlying structures um, or the um, uh, haroid. Um, these detached areas may expand over time, like um, think of it as wallpaper that once tore and slowly peels off a wall. It's kind of that same thing happens. The retina becomes ischemic and stops functioning, causing vision loss. Um, retinal detachment is typically painless. Its clinically manifestations often include flashes of light in the peripheral vision field blurred vision, floaters, and darkening vision. Um, its diagnostic procedures include um, ophthalmic exams. Sometimes they can do an electro-retinogram and immediate surgery. Um, this is um, a medical emergency, so it needs to be treated. 
Filtrations and accommodation. Accommodation is a process where the thickness of the lens changes. You can have ocular motion, motor nerve changes, uh, decreased flexibility of the lens. They can be manifestations by diplopia, which is double vision, blurred vision, or headache. Um, also, you can get presbyopia is a condition in which the ocular lens becomes larger, firmer, and less elastic on reduced near vision, causing the individual to hold reading materials that are moist. This is why everybody that usually is um, over 45 to 48 starts to experience. Your alterations in refraction is most common visual problem. You have myopia, which is nearsighted. They see up close clearly but distance is blurry. There's hyperopia, which is farsighted. They can see a distance clearly, but up close is blurry. Um, they can have astigmatism, um, and those can coexist with myopia, hyperopia, and presbyopia. Um, that's where unequal curvature of the cornea light rays are bent unevenly and do not come together in a single focus on the retina. So vision is not crisp and clear, it's slightly blurred. So keratitis is inflammation of the cornea. Um, it's caused from trauma, bacteria, welding, contact lens overuse, and viral infections. In non-ulcerative, all layers may be affected, but epithelial layer remains intact. In ulcerative, inflammatory processes in which part of the epithelial stromal or both are destroyed. Um, clinical manifestations can be severe pain, erythema, drainage, excessive tearing, photophobia, and visual disturbances. Um, complications can include corneal scarring, glaucoma, and a cataract. Um, it depends on the cause, but usually ophthalmic and oral antibiotics and corticosteroids. Um, it really does depend on the cause as to how we treat it. Just here's a picture of keratitis. Conjunctivitis is an infection or inflammation of conjunctiva, or otherwise known as pink eye. It's caused by viruses or bacteria. It's um, typically it's streptococcal, chlamydia, gonorrhea. It could be an allergen, um, chemical irritant, or trauma. It is highly contagious. It is the most common form of eye disease. Um, symptoms can be edema, blurred vision, photophobia, itching, burning, pain, and drainage. If it's watery, it's typically allergy, virus, or a foreign body. Mucopurulia, it's going to be bacterial. Unilateral suggests irritation or a foreign body. Um, we are going to treat with um, antibiotics, um, typically eye drops, and good hand washing, meticulous to be exact. Um, they can use cold compresses on their eyes, but obviously you want them to use good uh, to like use clean ones each time. And this is one reason that we treat newborns in as soon as they are born um, with antibiotic eye drops is so they don't take a chance of getting one of these infections coming through the breast canal. Here's a couple different um, pictures showing different types of conjunctivitis. Um, we're going to talk auditory dysfunction. The first one is conductive hearing loss. It's impaired sound um, conduction from outer to inner ear. Symptoms can be diminished hearing, and they will talk in a soft speaking voice. Um, they can be, it can be temporary if it's caused from like a cerumen impaction, fluid in the middle ear, or a foreign body. It could be permanent. If it's from thickening or damage to the tympanic membrane, um, otosclerosis, or chronic otitis media. The sounds are conducted through the bones of the head, sound louder, like chewing or their own voice, which is why they are soft spoken. Um, Sensoronearing, hearing loss, is impair, impairment of the um, organ of the corti or the central connections. It's perceptive hearing loss occurs with disorders that affect the inner ear, auditory nerve, or auditory pathways of the brain. 
Sound waves are conducted to the inner ear, but abnormalities of the cochlear apparatus or auditory nerve decrease or distort transfer of information to the brain. Um, tinnitus often accompanies this. Um, tinnitus is the first sign, and then it could go to a high-pitched tone, sensory neural hearing loss that is permanent. Um, and um, presbycusis is age-related hearing loss, which is the most common for the sensory neural hearing loss in elderly people. So Meniere's disease is an episodic disorder of the middle ear where there is excessive um, endolymph and pressure in the membranous labyrinth that disrupts both vestibular and hearing functions. They actually have four symptoms that just keep happening. They have vertigo, hearing loss, ringing in the ears, and feeling a fullness in the ears. Um, the cause is really unknown, but could be associated with a trauma infection or vascular disorder. Treatment is symptomatic with medical management or surgical management when medication fails. Um, this can be really affect their lives. Um, sometimes these people, um, can be bedridden when they're having um, an attack of the Meniere's disease. And it seems like when it flares, it flares. And when they're doing well, they're doing well. It's a really interesting disease. Um, otitis externa, infections of the outer ear, um, is commonly caused by prolonged um, moisture or exposure. It could be, we call it swimmer's ear. Um, it's caused by infection, irritant, or allergic reactions. Um, it's usually Pseudomonas staphylococcus aureus or E. coli rarely. Um, its symptoms are inflammation with pruritus, redness, tenderness, narrowing of the ear canal, and drainage from the ear. Um, we treat with antibiotic ear drops and sometimes corticosteroid drops. Otitis media, infection um, or inflammation of the middle ear. Um, acute otitis media is acute middle ear infection. They can have effusion, um, which means pus, essentially, or fluid in the ear. Otitis media with effusion is um, presence of fluid in the middle ear without symptoms of acute infection. Um, risk factors um, is children in uh, child care group settings, um, feeding the kids supine, smoke exposure, pest fire use, oral, oral facial deformities. Um, it commonly will follow an upper respiratory infection. Its manifestations is ear pain, crying, irritability, rubbing or pulling at ears, mild hearing deficit, sleep disturbance, red bulging tympanic membrane, fever, lace, chills, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea headache. Um, usually the prescription we're going to give is symptomatic management, antibiotics, reoccurrent, if they get reoccurrent ear infections um, and a risk is having it before one month, they usually will end up with what's called a myringotomy, which is where we put ear tubes in. Complications can include mastoiditis, brain abscess, meningitis, and chronic otitis media with hearing loss. Um, they can have speech and language delay, and they can have cognitive delays that they can't hear. I know we talked about some of this in the other chapter. So sensory, um, somatosensory function, um, sensory unit relays information about touch, temperature, pain, and body position. Um, we have the dermatomal patterns of innervation. Sensory input into each spinal cord segment is provided by sensory neurons. A dermatome is a region of the body that's supplied by a single pair of dorsal root ganglion. And you can see how the different dermatomal patterns are by the picture on the right. So, um, Vertigo is a disorder of vertebral function in which um, illusion of motion. So people experience vertigo, have a sensation that they are 
they are or the room is spinning or moving. Um, clinical manifestations can be nausea, vomiting, nystagmus, or loss of balance. We need to rule out dizziness, lightheadedness, syncope. Dizziness is an inability to maintain a normal gait. That is not the same as vertigo. Um, it is diagnosed usually through physical exam, um, CT, or MRI. Um, treatment is pharmacologic, um, anticholinergic agents, antihistamines, and antiemetics. Um, vestibular nystagmus is the constant involuntary movement of the eyeball. I believe we are done with this chapter. Thanks, guys. Have a good day.